This is Brother Alex Larson. He is a member of Morning Star Baptist Church in Packlet, South Carolina. And uh, I thank God for Brother Alex. Now, my church, uh, I've already told you a little bit about how long we go back. Uh, we go back uh, a, a, to our teenage years. We went to school together. I actually worked our worked, uh, first jobs together. And uh, I knew Brother Alex as a lost man and uh, didn't want anything to do with God, didn't care anything about the Lord. And uh, several times I tried to talk to Alex about the Lord and uh, he wouldn't necessarily blow me off, but he let me know that he wasn't interested in it. And uh, we still loved him anyway. And then uh, tried to, tried to uh, just uh, tried to, you know, live, live in front of him. I hope I, I hope I did a decent job of that anyway. I wish I'd have done better. Amen. Uh, but I, I'll say this. I thank God for what God has done to take uh, someone who was not interested in anything about the Lord and then save him and, and, and touch his family, work in his family, uh, call him to preach. I remember, man, I'm telling you, I shouted, uh, I shouted in my own house when I heard that Alex Larson had been called to preach. And uh, amen, the shouted when he got saved, shouted when he's called to preach, and then to hear he's going to the mission field. What a wonderful thing the grace of God is in our lives. Amen. And uh, so I'm going to let him, t I told that about him so he wouldn't have to take his time to do it. And uh, so I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about since God saved him, since God called him, and uh, since God has now called him to the mission field about what the Lord's going to have for them to do. And I'll let him take about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so, and tell us a little bit about what the Lord is doing in their heart as of late as missionaries. Preacher, thank God you're here. Love sure you. do love you. Thank Amen. You. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be saved. Amen. Good to know that I'm saved. I, I tell you, brother, there's... Back then, there's one place I never thought it'd be, and it'd be behind the pulpit, your pastor, and that, that's for sure. But praise the Lord for grace and mercy. Praise the Lord. I went from the guttermost to the uttermost. I'm no longer that man I used to be, brother. Praise the Lord. I thank Brother Josh for all that, or Brother Lawson, I'm sorry, for all that he's done and uh, witnessing to me back in the day, even though it went in one ear and out the other. I still remember it to this day. You living for the Lord when everyone around you wasn't. And I, I thank you for that. Well, like you said, we're the Larsons, the Ison. My wife is Shree. Oldest daughter is Isabella. Young, or my only son is Nikolai. My youngest daughter is Melody. We're at a Morning Star Baptist with a Macedonia World Baptist Mission Board. Amen. And we are called to Iceland. Amen. And Man, when that first happened, I'm going to tell you, I started to quit. Lord, you know, the Bahamas are real nice this time of year. You know, if it's got to be an island, Hawaii, I don't need a passport for that. And, you know, but he uh, really just impressioned in my life and my heart, Iceland. And then I got the bug. I started researching. I started Google mapping. I mean, I could tell you everything from it just from a picture from the sky now. But um, then uh, I started to see the real need. The real need that they had there is, y'all have had the brother, or the Sears recently, so y'all know a good bit of it, but there is only one independent Baptist church in Iceland. There's 380,000 people there as of last year, their last statistics. 380,000 people with one independent Baptist church. We do not realize how blessed we are. We do not realize how blessed we are. And on top of that, we're right at the buckle of the Bible Belt. On top of that, we have opportunities to get real gospel all around us. Is there a need to spread the gospel in South Carolina? Absolutely there still is. But we are blessed with the amount of good godly preaching churches we have around us. Good King James believing, not compromising on the word, not submitting to this world. But they do not have that option there. There is one church. Iceland is also known as the land of fire and ice. It is absolutely Gorgeous. When we were there, we're standing and looking at a giant waterfall a couple miles behind it. You can see a glacier, and we were staying at the church a couple weeks ago. We just came back from our survey trip, and a 5.2 or 5.3 earthquake hit, and a volcano erupted while we were on the island. So we were literally in the land of fire and ice at the time. But as beautiful as that is, they also go by the preacher's graveyard. They are very, very resilient to the gospel. They are very hateful 
of the gospel. The church that is there has been trying to be shut down several times by the government, by local organizations, by the supermarket across the street, tried everything they could to shut them down up to building a wall 10 feet out of their front door that was going to be 20 feet high. I already drew the pylons in and everything, but praise the Lord. They didn't give up. They didn't surrender. The Lord opened the door as that wall came down before it ever went up, and they are still standing to this day preaching the gospel. There's a brother Patrick Weimer has been there 24 plus years, and uh, we're going to be working firsthand with him and the Sears family. We're going to really, we feel like the Lord has gotten us to go there and help them and grow that ministry before he wants us to go plant anything else. You know, the Lord just put it in my heart that why would I want you to start something when there's already something that needs to be finished. Sure. You know, with the Bible says to finish our race. And that race needs to be finished. That work needs to continue to grow and continue to increase. But they also speak Icelandic there. Brother Josh, you remember me in high school and my language arts grade was very bad. I don't think I passed. <laughs> so please be praying for us. We do have to learn the language. We do have to learn Icelandic and that was uh, that's already going to be a struggle but that will be one thing we have to do when we get there during our first term, first couple of years it will be the first thing we get put in the academy there to learn the language. Um, my pray, pray for my wife. She has just started homeschooling and that is a change. You know, Know, we had to pull them out of pull them out of regular schools so we could go to meetings like this. In what was it in 2018? There was a recent poll by the I'm gonna say this one time, brother, by the atheist organization Icelandic Ethical Humanist Association, that 93.9% .9 of people in Reykjavik under 25 believe the universe was created by the Big Bang. That is right at 94% of young people believe that the universe is created by the Big Bang. That is, the other 6.1% of young people in the poll either thought the universe came by other means or simply it had no opinion. It just happened. But 0% in this poll, 0% of people under 25 believe God created the universe. Why is that so important? Well, brother, you have a youthful group. You just had a, a wonderful display of your youth up here. Next door was youth coloring and having fun. Well, when the youth are not taught of God, it only takes one generation. That's all it takes to remove that wonderful heritage. You can have the best heritage you have, and in one generation it can be wiped away. That is what they are facing. The little bit of heritage they have left is on the brink of extinction from not being taught about it. Judges 2, 10 through 12. And also that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. Right. Nor yet the works which he had done before Israel and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. It can still happen. It happened in... Abraham's in them days. It happened when the, some of the most godly men ever to be talked about in this Bible were walking the earth, when miracles were happening in front of them, when they got delivered from Egypt. And it can happen today. And I'm sad to say it can happen in America today. It can happen in the Bible Belt today. We have to guard our children in that generation coming up. We have to protect them. Iceland has cured Down syndrome, brother. That sounds great, but no, it's not. How they cured it is 100% of women get abortions with any, any chance of there being an abnormality. Not only that, it is strongly pushed by doctors. Yes, we have it here in America too, but it is almost forcefully pushed by doctors there. They're trying to get a perfect, 
gene. They're trying to eliminate everything that could possibly hinder their name or hinder their lineage. So as, when they put it in the papers that they have cured it, it sounds great until you start reading it. And then you're like, this is just murder. This is all you're doing. I'm not, not here to preach on that. I know you do enough of it, brother. So why Iceland? Now, more than the statistics, more than the great need they have for the gospel with Jesus Christ made a prayer request in Matthew 9, 36 through 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray thee therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. Why did Jesus Jesus Christ have compassion. The verse right before it, it says that he was going around healing the sickness, healing the lame, healing all sorts of diseases. But that is not why Jesus had compassion on the multitude. Yes, there were sick. Yes, there was poor and poverty. No, he had compassion because he looked out and saw hundreds and hundreds of people that were going to die and go to hell knowing not who Jesus was. They had no shepherd to lead them to Christ. They had no one to teach them of the word of of God. They had no one to preach to him. That is why he had compassion and that is why he made this prayer request for his disciples to pray to God that they would send forth laborers to the harvest. We are called to be that laborer. Yes, and in the last five minutes while we were there it was absolute tremendous. Now if you look up Iceland it says it's about 60 to 80 percent Christianity there or Christians which sounds wonderful. It is completely false. The statistics are 100% wrong. As we're driving through, there's beautiful little churches all over the place. Every little town, every little Packwood or Cowpins or their crazy names they call them that I can't pronounce, every one of them has a little town or a little church. And I started to ask people, why are these churches here if I'm here? Why are all these little churches here but I'm a missionary here? Every single one of them is nothing but a statue of a past. A statue of when the Roman Catholics moved in and they started planting as many churches as they could. Now they are empty, hollow shells serving nothing more as graveyards. They did have a form of Christianity at one time. Now, while the statistics are so high, if you were born in Iceland and you have a former member of the church is associated with or is a member of a church, you automatically become that member. In the same way around here that when I was lost, my mama was a good godly woman, so I called myself a Christian because I knew somebody that was, because I had that godly heritage. We all know or have met somebody whose great-grandma or grandma is a God-fearing woman, and they identify as a Christian but wouldn't step foot in the church. That's the same way there. We went door knocking to prove this fact. You know, I don't like to just read statistics and call it what it is. So we went around door knocking and we had a little survey with eight questions on it. And uh, the first thing I asked is, are you a Christian? He said, yes, absolutely. I said, well, good, we're on the right track. I hit the right door the first time. I said, do you believe in a creator? He said, no. I said, well, <laughs> you're a Christian, but you don't believe in a creator. We'll keep going. What is the Bible to you is the second question. I said, nothing. It's a buck. What do you mean? What is it to me? How often do you go to church? And I said, not funerals, baptisms, and weddings. Just per year. I said, zero. I don't go to church. And he started out identifying as a Christian, but so far it's a no for everything. Do you think the Christians should teach about Jesus in the Bible? He said, no. Do you believe in heaven? This one should be a dead giveaway if you're calling yourself a Christian. He said, no. If you believe in heaven, what do you, or what do you have to do to get there? He said, there is no heaven. What is the purpose of the church? Why does the church exist? He said, funerals, the graveyard, that's it. And that's all those little churches are to them. It's nothing more than a graveyard, no pews left in them anymore, beautiful stained windows, but that's it. A hollow shell, what once stood. And I said, do you know why Jesus came and lived on the earth? He said, no. And I was like, well, maybe this is, maybe this is just this one house. And Let's test it more. 
I went to another house. Now, they didn't slam the door in my face. They were actually incredibly polite. But the second I mentioned I'm a Christian from America, conversation was over. Happened again, happened again. Got another person that was willing to talk to us. They gave us the exact same answers, but started out with, I am a Christian. And it made me realize that the statistics are simply they're Christians because somebody once was around them, and that's it. That was enough. I'm here to tell you, I can't save you. Your grandma can't save you. Your mama's faith will not and never has saved anybody. You have to be the one to come to know Christ. You have to be the one to come to know Him. And in the last minute and a half I have, we, uh, while we were there, we had the chance to walk up a mountain. Brother, I'm not an athlete. For one, we had done put down seven miles for that day. Then we got to the bottom of this mountain, and we're starting to go up it. About three-quarters of the way, it was already rough. And my kids were making me look real bad because they were running up the thing. <laughs> We finally got to the top, and it really, the Lord really put it in my heart because it took four years for us to just be able to get to Iceland for her survey trip after it got canceled. It took four years, that hardship, everything that we have done, every blood, sweat, and tears, every hour of Bible college, Bible study, church meeting, everything that we had ever done was just like that walk up the mountain. It was absolutely terrible. But the mountaintop experience when we got to look out, brother, and see where the Lord had called us was absolutely wonderful. Then the Lord showed me, you can't live here. The winds were too rough. The 80 mile an hour wind on top of the mountains. It was too hard to stay there. As wonderful as the mountaintops are, we don't live there. But what makes them so great is the journeys that we have to go through before we can get to that mountaintop experience. And my wife did get her confirmation while we were there. The song she sang a minute ago, she was singing while we were in Iceland at the church service. And the Lord really confirmed it in her heart that the, the new home that she's going to is heaven, but it's also going to be Iceland. So that was the whole point of the survey trip. It was wonderful. Continue to pray for us. Continue to just keep us in your thoughts and prayers as we continue on with deputation. I thank you again for allowing us to come, brother. It's been wonderful. Y'all have been absolutely tremendous to us. God bless you. Love you, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. missionary to Southeast Asia. I grew up in church most of my life and then as a teenager I come to know the Lord as my Savior and shortly after that the Lord called me to preach and then I pastored a church. I started Amazing Grace Baptist Church in 1994 where I was there for 28 years until last year when the Lord called me into full-time missions. We battled it for a while and we kept putting it off and putting it off but just could not just couldn't shake it. And I knew that I had to spend the rest of my life doing what God had called me to do. And we're going to go and try to, we're not going to change the world, but we're certainly going to go and try to make a difference. My first trip to Southeast Asia was in 2009. And it was amazing to see how hungry they were for the gospel. And you could actually go into public schools and public colleges and, and just preach the gospel. And, and so I came back and I continued pastoring for many, many years and kept going and taking trips until last year when the Lord called my wife and myself to Southeast Asia to be full-time missionaries. We was able to help plant a church in a village of about 500. It took about $10,000 and we was able to help them raise it. But this church actually came up with about $2,000 of their own money. I'm talking about poor people. I'm talking about people with dirt floors in their house. But they've been taught to tithe and they've been taught to give. But while I was there, before it was built, they had a little bamboo hut that they were using as a chapel, as a church. It's called Blessing House Baptist Church. And at the end of the service, the interpreter, he asked if anybody had anything to say after I preached. And a man came up front, an older gentleman, and he was just a weeping. And he... He thanked us for being there, and he thanked, He said, I want to. I appreciate you Americans helping us with this church. He said, now, right down the road beside an old cornfield, he said, we're going to be able to have our own building. To be a missionary is a, is a great privilege, even after pastoring for many, many years, but then now having the opportunity 
to go to the other side of the world where there are millions that have never heard. There's nothing like taking the Word of God and giving it to someone who has never even seen a Bible before. We can't even begin to imagine that. When, and when you do that, it just does something to you that you want to go back and you want to make a difference. I just believe that we're running out of time and we've got to take and do what the Lord has called us to do. Good to be here tonight and never been here to Beacon Baptist Church, and but uh, we're about an hour down the road, I guess, from here down I-20, but it's good to be in church on Wednesday night. How many of y'all glad to be in church tonight? Amen. Amen. How many of y'all, y'all rather be here than in jail? Amen. Amen. So, uh, well, not everybody raised their hand there. I don't know. Y'all must have a pretty nice jail around here. So. But uh, we are David and Susan Hickson, and as the video said, I did start the Amazing Grace Baptist Church there in Beach Island in 1994, and uh, we built buildings and things through the years and run buses and did all the normal um, church things, And and uh, but I started going on mission trips about 20 years ago. I went to Mexico two or three times, and Honduras, and Dominican Republic, and the Philippines, and just, just every, about every three or four years. Years. You know, we'd have a mission conference like this, or I'd have a missionary in, and we'd get to talk, and next thing I know, I'm planning a trip, you know, going to see these people, and and uh, so I always kind of had a heart for missions, but for years, my, my, my motive, I guess, or my goal there was, is that, hey, you know, this is what God wants me to do. People in the church all the time would say, yeah, you're going to come back from one of them trips we know, and you're going to, you know, tell us you're going to be a missionary, and I said, no, I you know, I, I felt like, you know, I was doing my part, supporting missionaries and, and doing all of that. And so, but it was, it was just a couple years ago. It's like God just started dealing with me about going to full-time missions. And, and uh, I mean, I couldn't sleep at night. I mean, I just couldn't. I mean, I, I just knew that I had to take and say, okay, Lord, here I go. And so we did at our revival, actually, uh, about a year and a half ago on the Sunday night of that revival meeting. My wife and I went forward, told the people what we were doing. There was only two people there that knew what what uh, what would uh, know our plan in advance, and that was my two sons. We have two boys; they're 28 and 31, and um, and so we uh, we surrendered. We took, we put our house on the market. It sold the next day, and uh, we took and we actually lived in a camper for about 10 months. We don't live in that anymore. That gets old, you know. That's camping's not recreation when you do it that way. And um, but we uh, uh, so we hit the deputation trail. We stayed around for a few months, and I was telling somebody before the service and try to help them find a pastor. Got a young guy in there doing a tremendous um, job, and so we actually were there a few weeks ago. And I preached. They wanted me to come back and preach the 29th homecoming, and got to, got to go back and see uh, some of the people and all of that. But um, but we uh, people say, you know, why? Why Southeast Asia? And I mean, if you look on a globe, it is literally on the other side of the world. And, but you know, when you take and you, you go somewhere where people have never heard the gospel, there's not, a, there's not a church on every corner, you know, as this brother was, was talking about, you know, Iceland. You know, when you, you just, you can't, you know, until you, you know, you take and you, you, you meet people that have never even seen a Bible before. Yeah. You know, it just, uh, uh, you want to do something about it. You know, and so that's where God has called us to. My wife uh, went, uh, our first trip was in 2009. In 2018, she went over with me. And then last year, after surrendering to take, and it kind of, we had started deputation, but then we, we went for about three weeks last summer and spent there in Thailand just visiting some of those church plants that the video talked about. And actually, when we were there, that church uh, uh, that was 
built that the video was talking about, that is in an Aka village. There's 400,000 Aka tribal people in, uh, in, in Thailand. And we believe that's where God uh, wants us to be and wants us to work with the Aka people. I actually have an Aka Bible there on the, on the, uh, uh, on the, on the, the display back there. I have a Thai Bible and also a Burmese um, Bible there. I actually just came back from Thailand last night. So if, I feel like if you see me just kind of nod, no, it's uh, I got in about midnight last night after about two weeks. And so I'm, I'm there 12 hours ahead of us. So it's already, you know, I suppose I, I should have already slept and it's, it's actually already th uh, Thursday morning over there. So the jet lag is kind of catching up with me. But um, there's a there's a young man we're going to be working with, and his name is his name is Warchai. We actually have a few a few of his prayer cards there on the back table. He's never been to America. He's tried to come. They they keep turning his visa down. It's very tough for a native Thai person to come to America. Um, but he has a unique story, and I'll I'll share this with you. And and he uh, when he was about nine years old, his mother dropped him out at a children's home. She loved him, but she couldn't afford to even feed him. And she knew that he would have a better life. Well, this, this children's home was actually uh, started and run by an American missionary from Tennessee. His name is Richard Horn. And so Warchai, all through his teen years, he was basically trained, knows good English uh, because of the American missionary. Well, when, when, uh, when Warchai was about 20 years old, which was he's about 32 now, so this was about 12 years ago, Richard Horn got sick and he came back to the States and he came back to, uh, back to Tennessee there to his, to his home church. He was out of Franklin Road Baptist Church. Well, he went to the doctor. He didn't know what was wrong with him. found out he had cancer, and it wasn't long after that he died and went to heaven. So there's Warchai in the other side of the world. His mentor, the one that taught him good Bible doctrine, taught him uh, English, taught him all these things, he's not coming back. Well, a few years after that was when we met Warchai, and he was just kind of, you know, doing the best he could and that kind of thing. But um, when, you, when you meet somebody in Thailand, first of all, if they know English, you kind of well, you hit it off a little bit, you know. And so we talked to him, and we realized this guy believes the same way we believe. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so he actually pastors two churches now. Uh, one of them is that Aka church because he was born Aka. So he knows the Aka language. Of course, he knows English. He knows Thai. And he actually knows Burmese because the, the church is right there on the border of Myanmar. And so what a, uh, uh, what a blessing Brother Warchai is. I mean, what a blessing he has uh, been to our many interprets for us. The first time that we went last year, I actually was, was they had a, um, at the church there, they had, you know, I think, you know, several that was, that was, I mean, they just packed it out. It was outside under a little lean-to thing. And, and, well, when I would say something, you know, and I'd say, take your Bible, you know, turn to John chapter 4 or whatever. Well, then usually it's just kind of back and forth. Well, I'd say something, and then there he is. He's going on and on. I'm wondering, what is this guy telling these people? And then I'd say something. It seemed like it'd take him forever because he was an interpreter in three different languages. He knew, he knew who was there and what they could speak. And so I didn't know that till after the service. But, um, but, you, but it's just such a, such a blessing to have, you know, someone like, him and I uh, one of the goals and one of the reasons why I went back over through that I was there for the last two weeks was Brother Warchai had never been ordained and so we had an ordination service for him um, also that building that we talked about in the in the video we had a dedication service for him and all this happened last Saturday and then of course they had church on Sunday but they they invited people I mean these people came and I mean they, they made a big deal out of it and there was 
was over 260 of them that showed up. And uh, I mean, just uh, uh, just was a tremendous, tremendous time. They had a big charter where they would take and they would, uh, they came up at the end of the service and they signed it because they chartered the, the service. And those were the, you know, the, the charter members of that church. And they have these Aka people. I mean, they dress up in all this colorful stuff. You can see the pictures back there on our display. And, but, but uh, uh, just a blessing to be able to take and to work with them. But that's where we'll live, right there on that northern border. We already have a, 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 a place there to stay. And, but we, that, that property that was purchased there, where we built that building, um, there's a, there, right in a cornfield, as it says, but there's a cornfield beside it that's about, probably a, about two acres there that we actually can purchase, that the same owner owns that. And we want to build a training center there. We want to build, you know, that where we can continue to train young men like Warchai, he knows a ton of young people. He's actually a soccer coach. He's a great. He's a he loves soccer all of his life. Very good at it. Um, he, of course, they call it football over there. And uh, but he, uh, so he has all these young people on the team. And in order to be on the team, you have to be in church on Wednesday night. You have to be in church on on Sunday, or you or you you can't be on the team. And uh, boy, we need that needs to be that way in America. Amen. It's Instead of sports taking you out of church, it ought to put you in church, but that's a, another sermon. But, and so we want to take and we want to train these young men just to continue to do what we've already done, and that is just continue to plant churches. And, uh, but the, 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 the sky is the limit, you know, to what. So you pray, uh, pray with us about that and the money that's needed there to take and to try to, you know, purchase that land. We already talked to the owner when I was there this past week, and, and, uh, but our goal is we're at about 60 percent. We've been on deputation about 17 months, and uh, so we should be finished with deputation probably next May or June, somewhere along there. And so y'all, y'all just get one of those prayer cards and and, uh, and 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 pray for us if you would. And you know, there's there's about uh, and, and I didn't I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago, and I was actually in a missions conference up in uh, I was still pastoring at the time. I was in a mission conference up around Atlanta and there was a guy there and he was given a lot of statistics about the Bible in different languages around the world and he was talking about how that there's over 7,000 known languages in the world and he said out of those 7,117 known languages there's only 697 of them that have a whole copy of God's Word in their language and when I heard that, I, I thought, man, that just seems kind of far-fetched. So I went and I'd done a little research myself and realized that, oh, he was right. Actually, there's, at this point now, there's 704 of them that have a, the Word of God in their, in their language. That's only about 10% of the world's languages. Now, I don't know about you, but that bothers me. Amen. Absolutely. You know, and when you think of now, there's about there's about half of them. There's about 3,500 of those languages that have some portion of God's word, like a John and Romans or something of that nature. Just south of where we'll be uh, working there in Indonesia, the fourth largest country in the world, 280 million people. There's a people group there of 1.2 million. There's no Bible in the language that they speak. Nothing. They don't have anything. Last summer, I, 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 they called me from Bearing Precious Seed. I have a friend of mine, Brother Dale Money. I don't know if y'all know him. He's from down in our area. He's been working with Bearing Precious Seed for several years. And he called me and he said, I see where you're going to, the, to the, the, uh, uh, that 1040 window. Y'all have heard missionaries and stuff probably talk about the 1040 window. It's that area of the world that takes up a lot of Asia, Africa, India, where the, some of the poorest of the poor live and where those that have, that have never heard the gospel. It actually is about over 4 billion people. It's about 65% of the world's population lives there. Wow. It's also an area where less than 10% of all missionaries go. It's also an area where less than 2% of all money given to missions goes. 
and where the, where the word of God in some languages just has, hadn't made it there yet. But he gave me something when I went. He, he said, we're having a first Bible uh, international meeting going on, a conference. He said, I'd love for you to come. And what First Bible does, they get the Bible translated into languages to give people their first Bible. And he gave me something, and I'll show this to you, and then I'll sit down. It's called the Tribal Bible. Maybe some of y'all have seen this. I don't know. And I said, well, what in the world is that? He said, well, it's just something we put together a few years ago, just something symbolic for those people groups that have no Bible in their language." yet. And we just call it the tribal Bible. He says it's all we got. It's the best we can do right now. And but, but this is what's in the tribal Bible. There's millions around the world. That's all they got right now. Basically nothing. How would you like to have a Bible like that? There's millions. That's all they have. That's all they have. I have a friend of mine, a missionary in India, and he was telling me how that this past year they, they had this kind of promotion where they had printed a whole pile of the Bibles and shipped them over there, and it was in the language of this particular village that they knew that it was very limited when it comes to Bibles. Most of those people had never seen a Bible. And so they went and they spent several days and they went through those villages with interpreters and they, they, they told the people, if you come to church on Sunday, we're going to give you your own Bible. So Sunday came, and I mean, people walked in. They rode, you know, motorcycles in different ways that they could get there, and they packed that place out. And then they took and they took that pile of the Bibles, and they began to pull the shrink wrap off of it and hand those Bibles out. Well, they looked in the back of the church, and there was a woman back there, and she was she was holding that Bible, and she was just a weeping. And they went back there, and they said, "Ma'am," they said, "Are you okay?" And she said, well, she said, I must have misunderstood. She said, when they came through my village yesterday and they told me that if I come to church today, I would receive my own Bible. She said, I misunderstood. She said, I thought they said that if I come to church today, I would see a Bible. This lady had never seen a Bible. Hey, folks, we're blessed people tonight, are we not? God is so good to us, and we take it for granted, don't we? we tell, how many of us have several, several Bibles? Several Bibles. It's a huge step in our life, no doubt, but y'all pray for us as we take and we do what we believe God has, has, has called us to do. It's called us to do. And when I, when I, when, uh, uh, when Brother, uh, Brother Warchai took me to the airport the other day there in Chiang Rai, and, uh, you know, he gave me a hug and just cried. And I said, Brother, I'll be back. I'll be back. And so we, uh, uh, y'all just pray for us that, uh, you know, I, like I said on the video, I think we're running out of time. I think we're running out of time. We got we to gotta go through them open doors while God's got them open. I think he's opened up some doors around the world, and he's given us the opportunity. And he's saying, hey, he's given that one last opportunity. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Amen. Good to be here tonight. I appreciate it.